Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey, and welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you so much for choosing this podcast because we know you have a lot of choices when it comes to podcasts, but this is the show that is designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show every single week with Craig Brown, an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Tom. And um, you know what? A few weeks ago, we talked about if we're lucky, by the time we get to June, this pandemic thing will be under control. You know what? It's feeling better and better. I mean, I, at least within the United States, it's a little frustrating worldwide. But gosh, good darn it, we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it. I was at a conference in Las Vegas last week, and it was as if there had never been COVID. All the casinos were packed. Everybody was there. And it made me a little nervous. I don't know that I was... Uh, I am going to say, I'm not, I'm not ready to go there yet. Did, did you watch the golf tournament on the weekend? That'll tell everybody what day it is. The guy in the lead tested positive after the third round. What a... What? What bad luck. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, the next day I'm watching on TV and nobody's masked. And I'm like... I'm not sure I would do that. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> whatever. And I'm vaccinated, everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, well, so am I. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, we're just kind of moving along. But, but you know, I, I feel good. I feel like maybe there's going to be some live events in all of our industries coming up again later on this year and things like that. So, oh, yeah. so that's positive. I, th I think so. A couple that I'm associated with, we just confirmed again, we're going to do it in October and November. So Good, good for us. I hope everybody else in the world that listens, I hope you can follow too. The, the sooner, the better. Yeah, I'm going to be the MC of a group that just confirmed that they're doing their event in January. So they're pushing it a little out of this year, but but kicking off the mm -hmm. year with a, with a new event. So so we're, we're, we're headed that right direction. So the reason people come to the show is every single week, Craig and I try to bring to this podcast really interesting interviews and other ideas that are going to help all the listeners enhance and grow their careers. And today we have David Long. He is the president of Vitech, and what he does is he helps people get better at building really complex stuff. And I'll tell you what, that's what our listeners do. Our listeners build really complex stuff. So this is going to be great. Hey, David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Glad to be here. Glad to be vaccinated and good to see things moving forward. Awesome. So, so David, give us a little bit about your background and, and tell us about Vitech. Sure. So I'm a systems engineer. I've been a systems engineer for over 25 years. As you said, that means that I'm helping other people build really complex stuff. And I've spent that 25 years in a small company called Vitech who builds software tools, who trains, who consults with others to make them better at systems engineering. Interesting. So, so David, you said 25 years. So that is that your whole professional career or was there something before this? That is my whole professional career. I'm one of those oddballs back in the 90s who directly from school went into systems engineering. Yeah, okay. So so there's a bunch of oddballs 10 years older than you. I might be one of them. <laughs> but um, that's that was my question that I wanted to start out with is, how did you know you wanted to be system engineering? I mean, was this just something that you always knew it or something happened in school that told you this was the answer? So I always knew it, Craig. My father was a systems engineer. And ah, so while it's your dad's he, fault. Okay. Yeah, it's my dad's <laughs> fault. And he didn't set out to make me a systems engineer, but the way that he languaged the world and talked about things, he talked about interactions and dependencies. That's the language of systems. So before I even knew it, I always knew I wanted to be an engineer and I knew what that meant. But before I knew what systems meant, I knew I wanted to be a systems engineer. Okay, interesting. So did model-based system engineering come with that? Or is that a recent development in the last few decade or so? In the language, that's a recent development in the last, oh, it's about 18 years now. But the way okay. I was taught to do model, sorry, the way I was taught to do systems engineering is actually what we currently call model-based. It wasn't about process. It wasn't about visualization. 
It was about what is the key information that we need to elicit, analyze, and communicate to build complex stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I got invited to speak about uh, in my journey, and the audience has heard this before, but one of, one of the jobs was dealing with simulation methods, building new models uh, at that time of, of um, transmissions and combustion engines. And the people at the conference said, oh, we want you to come talk about MBSC. That's SysML. And I said, in just a second, if I'm going to talk about model-based, yeah, I'm glad you're laughing. If I'm going to talk about model-based system engineer, uh, system engineering, I want to talk about why we use models to improve system engineering. And, and I may or may not get around to the topic of SysML. Now, this was over a decade ago. And at the time, um, SysML was a different place than it is now. But my point is... Um, they're not really the same thing. And, and would you agree they're, they're the same thing or, or is one a subset of the other? So I would agree, Craig, they're not the same thing. And that confusion that you ran into 10 years ago is still there today. It's the greatest mm -hmm. myth. It's the greatest misunderstanding that we've got. I like to frame SysML, Systems Modeling Language, a profile of UML for those who don't know it. I frame that as a notation and approach mm -hmm. to do the descriptive architecture side of systems. Everything from a statement of need, through mm -hmm. what's the behavior that you need, through what's the logical and even in the physical architecture. Mm -hmm. But it's not about the analytical side. It's not about everything else. It is a notation and approach. Model-based systems engineering itself is so much bigger. Yeah, and so bravo. Thank you for saying all that. Because I, I think <clears throat> when you, when you like I came from a large car company, that's where I ended my career, right? And, and <clears throat> when the SysML people showed up, and, and some of them were consultants and some of them were inside, they said, like, my goodness, how is it? We've got all these mistakes. We need SysML. And, and us guys with a lot of gray hair said, oh, nonsense. Let me talk to you about this. And we brought up models from the 80s, even the 70s. And we've had fuel economy models for a long time, ever since CAFE was around. And so the point is we've been using models to improve decision-making for, for several decades, right? They weren't a notation, but they were a a reverence for whatever we learn in the field, we're going to put in a model and then we're going to use that model for the next gener you know, the next cycle of products. Right. So, so models are fun. Yeah. Craig models are fundamentally the way engineers think, analyze and communicate. Mm -hmm. And so as far as you can go back in time, anything that you could call a system, there was a model for that. The question is where was the representation and was it a full representation or partial SysML is just a tool that we have at our disposal today. It's, it's good for what it does, okay, not yeah. being critical of it, but it's not the end-all, be-all of the world. So, dear listeners, they are not the same thing. And if you want to know more, call David or Craig, though David's probably more available. I'm working on retirement. Um, <clears throat> anyways, okay, so let's, let's move on then. You mentioned in this paper, I, I heard you had a few weeks back, um, Model-Based Engineering Manifesto. Some people have heard about the Agile Manifesto. Um, others are uh, just worried that it's more terminology they got to go learn. T tell our audience about the Model-Based Engineering Manifesto. Sure. So the Model-Based Engineering Manifesto had the unfortunate coincidence of releasing in 2018, the same year that the U.S. Officer, Office of the Secretary of Defense released the Digital Engineering Strategy. And just so you know, Dr. Phil was on about six weeks ago. So okay. <laughs> carry okay. on. <laughs> and, and, and so Dr. Phil deserves all the credit for the digital engineering strategy, which is great, but it stole all the oxygen in the room. The uh, model-based yeah. engineering manifesto was published about four months earlier. And the way it came about is a group of 10 people from Sandia, Jet Propulsion Labs, Lockheed Martin, and others came together at the International Federation for Systems Research. And they mm -hmm. gathered to talk about how do we enhance data-driven systems engineering practices. They ended up publishing this manifesto instead. And note that it's a model-based engineering manifesto, right. not a model-based systems engineering manifesto. They took a step back, much like Phil Zimmerman and the digital engineering strategy, and said, if we really want to change the way that we deliver results, if we want to engineer better products, 
then we need to transform the entire life cycle, given the increased complexity, the interdependencies, and the fact the, the old ways have broken down. I like the fact that they modeled that manifesto after the Agile manifesto, which doesn't say do A instead of B. It says favor A over B. It's about the information, not the artifacts. It's about integration over independence. And so that's the the model-based engineering manifesto. Interesting. Okay. So we've learned something else. This is, this is good. Um, I, I also heard you talk about systems context or system central thinking and the important of context. Now, a lot of people designing a part, they, they've been told what key dimensions they have to follow. They know their manufacturing processes that they're really good. And so they know what they can and can't design. But if you told them their context was changing, it would probably drive them nuts because they're thinking about how to do a 3D representation in some CAD tool. Is it really the case that context changes all the time or, or, or maybe I misunderstood? So, so describe to a systems context and why that's so important to get your arms around it. Sure. Certainly at the whole of system level, our context keeps changing. If you think about, if you were going to deploy a new capability today, you would think about how you would interface with and interact with everything around you in the world. And as you're doing your product design, somebody else is upgrading theirs in the field. So at the big system level, things are constantly changing. One of the things that we wanna do in good engineering design and good architecture is to try to isolate those changes as best we can so that the person who's doing a really important piece part down in the middle of the system can do it, can do it to a stable specification. And when they deliver, we're all successful. You know, so this, this is interesting because tier ones, at least in the car companies, but probably in the aircraft companies too, you know, if, if you're a pump supplier, you get really good at understanding your pump and its operational uh, bandwidths, right? It's operational envelope, if you will. So the limits of where you can drive it, how, what speed you can drive it, how much fluid or air it's going to pump through the system and so on. And then they publish that to the aircraft manufacturer the, or the automotive manufacturer and say, well, anywhere in this bandwidth is fine. We'll, our, our system will work. We don't have to be specific to your specific use case. We just have to, we know that we'll operate in this bandwidth. <clears throat> and a lot of us would look at those data sheet and, and just say, okay, cool. We're in the operational bandwidth that'll work just fine. I, I, think, I think this has gotten lost in a lot of this debate about MBSE is this notion of there's an operational bandwidth. And if your subsystem meets that, then as the context change, that's okay as long as you don't violate the bandwidth. And it's easy to say that. It's actually kind of hard to find it. Yeah. But what's cool with model-based tools, especially simulation, oh, heck, you could explore that. So this notion of exploring context becomes really interesting to, to debate and think about because what does that do? It improves understanding, right? It just improves your knowledge about how well your thing will work. So so do you, do you see that as a, a, a benefactor sure of where we're at the fact that we could have more models now i can just hear some managers up the chain saying oh goodness don't send me more stuff because i can't manage what i got now but but that's a different debate we'll get to in a second yeah. but what do you think are, are simulation models helping us or or do they just confuse us with too many contexts no simulation models are absolutely essential because we don't have the time today either to design everything fresh to spec mm -hmm. as you yeah. laid out what we do at the system level is we try to establish a design envelope and then we pick a really good part producer who has a good part that operates within that envelope and we're good. So we can't afford to design everything to the infinite level of detail. We have to have reuse. But the other thing is then we have to have reason to believe before we physically build something that if we bring those pieces together, and they all operate within their design envelope, that the whole system will do what we want it to do, that all of those interconnections, all those interactions will give us the performance that we want without that dreaded unintended consequence. And if you can't do it digitally, if you can't do it via simulation, you can't do it fast enough, and it's going to cost way too much money. Yeah, you'll, you'll go back into prototype cycles and somebody shareholders if you're a commercial company, taxpayers if you're a military provider, 
somebody pays the bill for the cost overage, right? Um, okay, so so then I heard another idea, and I, I think we're talking around it, but let's let's bore into it a little bit. And that was this this idea of um, <clears throat> our focus shouldn't be manufacturing centric. I mean, of course, it should be so that we don't lose money, but but at some point there's other contexts besides financial. And and I I um I remember experiences when I left the aerospace world and joined the automotive world. And the guy I was working with, he said, oh, I'm just going to release my part first, because if I release first, everybody else has to adjust to me yeah. <clears throat> because they didn't want the cost, ch- the change cost of re-releasing the part. Right. And so, so it was an interesting <laughs> argument that I'd never heard before. It's like, wait a minute, I'm a systems guy. We have to come to an agreement and then we each have to do our part. Right. So, so is that what you meant by being system centric instead of manufacturing centric? Is it That's- all about the measures? What, what are the measures? So that's certainly part of it. And the key aspect of being system centric is recognizing the fundamental concept of a system is somehow when you bring the parts together, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. If you bring all the pieces of a car together, it will transport you from home to the office and back. So Mm -hmm. how does that happen? That happens by getting a good architecture that specifies what you need from each of those parts but also what the interactions are between those parts so that you can control them. Now, Craig, this is another place where context comes back and matters because good systems are always designed for their context. They're fit for purpose. The best car to transport uh, you on a sunny day in the summer may be a different vehicle than what a family of seven needs, okay? Mm -hmm. Different context, different need. And part of that context is what the business value is. It's not just about financial. Is your organization about quality, innovation, time to market, environmental impact? Those are all systems characteristics that have to be engineered in in a system-centric way up front or you're not going to get what you want at the end. Yeah. Okay, so so another phrase that you said, and I, by the way, we're going to have to give the people on the call here a link to your presentation because I, I just I just love the phrases. That's why you're here. Collective intelligence, unlocking collective intelligence. Give us some examples of that. Sure. So so Craig, to give you examples of that, you got to take a step back and understand what systems engineers are all about. Most people think systems engineers get involved in complex problems. And that's true, but there are a lot of people who get involved in complex problems. What's unique about systems engineers is we get involved in what are called transdisciplinary problems. No one discipline has all the knowledge necessary to understand the problem and solve it appropriately. So the concept of unlocking the collective intelligence is if you look at all the things necessary to have a plane fly in the air, you've got... Obviously, aerodynamics, you've got stress loads, you've got control surfaces, you've got all the electronics, et cetera. How do you gather the key representatives of that of those groups in a room, get their insights early so that you properly understand the problem and you can get to that architecture, that design envelope, the et cetera, so that people can go off, build their parts, and when they come together, they'll work. Fundamentally, go ahead. No, no, you're fine. Go ahead. So fundamentally, systems engineers are really, I like to describe them as the technical connective tissue that brings all these experts together, studies a problem from multiple viewpoints, and together we're a lot smarter than we are alone. This reminds me of the history of, of early flight, right? The Wright brothers and the people right before them and the people right after them. And uh, for those of you interested in a, a, a well, it'd be a 115 year old story now, but, but go back to that era and what, what did Wilbur and Orville do, especially Wilbur and, and he, the systems thinking is exactly how he solved the problems of modern controlled flight. And he did it through observing birds. And, and, you know, if you have nothing else to do on a day, sit out on your, your deck and look up in the sky and watch the feathers at the end of the wings and how they adjust ever so slightly to get controlled flight. Okay, so, so he had a model. He had controlled flight in these things called birds. But my goodness, they're amazingly light, right? And so he went off and built a really light aircraft, even 
built his own engine because he wanted it to be light, right? And and so, um, or he had his machinist build the engine actually. But the whole thing was about systems thinking, knowing the envelope, knowing what would work, looking for examples in nature, if not in other places, and then reusing those uh, where appropriate. So, so the way you described that just now, I, I think a lot of people might be asking themselves, if, if they were trained as a mechanical engineer, or a, a, a gasoline engine engineer, especially, <laughs> they, they might be thinking, oh my goodness, do I have to go learn a whole new discipline? And I think this this notion of, and it comes from colleges, everybody, this whole notion of discipline that you're, you're either mechanical or you're electrical or you're those embedded software guys or you're something else. Um, is system engineering across all those or, or do all those need to learn system engineering? I mean, what's your advice to, to uh, somebody in our generation, you know, older than 40, <laughs> uh, finding out they can no longer work on an internal combustion engine because the world's electrifying, right? So I think the world needs both, Craig. It's an error to skew one way or the other. Okay. Traditionally, we've all been trained to be real deep thinkers in narrow areas, which makes us excellent mechanical or electronic or electrical or psychoanalysts or something. and the way that we do this then says, let's take two additions. One is, let's bring in some systems engineers who are trained in systems thinking. They're trained to look laterally, not deep. Mm -hmm. They're trained to watch the interconnections, et cetera. And then let's take the people who have this critical deep knowledge and give them just a little bit of systems awareness, okay? okay. We don't need to make them, we should not make them systems engineers. But if we can make them a little more aware about interactions and systems thinking and ripple effects, second, third, fourth order ripple effects, then again, this combination can be very, very powerful. A systems engineer in isolation is nearly worthless. A systems engineer combined with some really, really good domain experts, incredibly powerful. They're especially worthless if they bring a new language that nobody else wants to learn. But I, I'm, no, I won't go back there. Okay, so so this has been a really interesting discussion. But one other thing happened in your background, and we've talked a bit about partnerships on this show. And I wanted to ask you, so if I if I got this correct, you're the founder of VI Tech, correct? Yes, you're correct. But now you're a piece of a company called Zucan. And a lot of us know Zucan if you're into wiring, at least in aircraft, uh, aircraft and, and automobiles. Uh, so everybody else out there is at Z-U-K-E-N. You can go look them up. How did you guys get to a partnership in your current, your current organization? So it, it actually all comes back to that idea of the digital engineering strategy that Phil Zimmerman talked about. Okay. And so Vitech is an expert in systems engineering. But systems engineering is actually just one capability required to deliver new products alongside good mechanical, good electronic, et cetera. And so what we needed to do was change our mindset from systems engineering in the narrow to how can we use systems engineering to enable the entire engineering lifecycle? That's engineering okay. of systems. And so as we started to collaborate with Zucan, because if you think about what interconnects modern systems, it's the electrical yeah. systems and the electronics. It's the signals, it's the right. <laughs> right. You got it. It was a very natural partnership. And so we were able to bring our systems engineering on top of their engineering capability. It actually happened relatively quickly because it was two organizations with a common vision, we were trying to connect to the greater stream. They were trying to move upstream into systems engineering. It's interesting. It's it, it just another example of partnerships that, that might, you know, evolve into something much, much more in depth like you guys have. And I, I, you know, what's been interesting to watch this last 18 months to two years is the revenue of the different tool vendors in the PLM space. And the, the one area that, most everybody, e even the vendors themselves, have misguessed is the electrical and the electronic. They have continued to grow in double digit, where everybody else has been, I mean, they've grown in a little bit, but they've been largely flat as, as big companies, you know, take a breath while we, we went, at least went through the early days of the pandemic. 
So it's been interesting that there's still this, this double digit growth going on in electronic and electrical and by association in system engineering as well, which is, which is why this is an uh, important topic. So, well, I, I appreciate you being a guest. I, I look forward to your next presentation. I'll keep you on my search list. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Tom. So this was a great conversation. So David, I, I like to, when I get a chance with some of our guests, especially ones who've had, you know, kind of a, a, a long career seeing a lot of, a lot of this stuff, what career advice do you have for people? I mean, I always, I always think about, you know, we talked about the fact that people who are systems engineers, their job kind of is bringing everybody together. And I've found people who serve in that role of being able to bring all the parts together, bring all the people together, they often get new opportunities. So I always think that's a smart piece of advice is, is be that glue who brings everybody together. What other piece of advice would you have for people to be able to advance their career in these areas? So that's absolutely the first item, Tom. And as a systems engineer, I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't say, hey, look, you don't have to transform yourself to a systems engineer. But as we talked earlier, have a little systems awareness because whatever you deliver is part of a system. And even if we want to just be good citizens of the world, we understand today that the impact that we have on the world around us is much greater. The other thing that, I, that I've done in my career that was absolutely critical is I got involved in a volunteer way in the professional body for my domain, which for me is in COSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering. That gave me an opportunity to network with people from around the world. It gave me leadership opportunities where, to be honest with you, I could make mistakes because they were over in the volunteer space, and then I could bring those skills back into the organization. And by the way, being a systems engineer and being a, a leader, a technical leader are very similar because oftentimes you don't actually have the true power. You're just influencing from the middle of the pack. So I'll give you those two, Tom. Oh, that's, that, that's awesome. And I think that, you know, you touched on that idea of getting involved. One of the reasons is you're networking, you're meeting people. And we talk about that a lot on the show. That's my area of expertise, that all opportunities that you're going to have throughout your, your career are going to come from people. I mean, the chair you're sitting in is a great chair but it's never going to send someone an opportunity. And so when we really get, you know, into these organizations like the Digital Enterprise Society and people actually volunteer, they work on projects, they learn those skills, but they're also working side by side with people and those lead to partnerships, job opportunities, etc. So so cheers, I think your advice is is spot on and everybody should listen to what David has to say. Thanks so much, Tom, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about digital engineering, systems engineering, and, and all those things as we advance. Awesome. Well, everybody who's listening, please remember, join us every single week for more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. Hey, the Digital Enterprise Society, it is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Go check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.